Hi everyone. Despite the generative AI frenzy captivating the tech world, the broader business sector remains cautious. What are the common roadblocks to preventing wider adoption? Do companies truly have the tools they need to harness this innovation? I interviewed a startup founder to dive into these questions. Keep watching to learn more. This video has three parts. Corporate use of generative AI, tackling risks with automated red teaming, and implications of increased adoption. Part one corporate use of generative AI. The question for this video is, why might companies decide to adopt or not to adopt generative AI? In my research, I found that there are at least three categories of risks that companies worry about when thinking about this decision. The first is security risks. They have to worry about hackers and cybersecurity incidents. The second is legal risks. They have to worry about regulatory compliance, infringing IP rights, etc. And the last is brand risk, where they worry about inaccurate information, hallucinations, and privacy concerns for their customers. These risks are all bad for a company because they all have the potential to be existential. A security risk means that you might end up paying a lot of money to recover from a hack. A legal risk means you could be sued out of existence. And brand risk means that your customers might just not trust you anymore. So there goes your market. To get more insight into this, IBM conducted a survey of more than 8,000 people around the world. These people all worked at relatively large organizations with 1,000 or more employees, because IBM, of course, cares about large enterprises. IBM has actually run this same survey for the past couple of years. So we have results, for example, from 2023 and 2024. One interesting question was they asked people what their organizations were worried about most when it came to deciding whether to adopt generative AI. The biggest worry was inaccuracy, where 63% of respondents were worried. That's up from 56% last year. Second was IP infringement, where 52% are now worried. Third on the list was cybersecurity with 51%. I thought that would be higher, to be honest. Then you have personal privacy at 43% and regulatory compliance at 42%. Those are the top five categories, and they actually all fit into security, legal, or brand risk that I mentioned earlier. So with all these worries and risks, are companies just not investing in AI at all? After all, you have people wondering if this is another AI winter, but that line of thought simply isn't true. AI investment jumped massively last year in 2023 with AI-focused startups raising $50 billion. In 2024, it has slowed down a bit, but in the first half of the year, startups collectively have already raised $27 billion, and almost half of that is AI-focused. Again, that's just startups in general General, yet half of it is for AI. So at least the AI startup space looks pretty healthy. But of course, there are lots of different sizes and types of companies that might be considering how much or how little to involve themselves with AI. When it comes to levels of involvement, you can either develop frontier models yourself and spend millions of dollars doing so, or just customize and fine tune existing models for your business use case, or even purchase an off the shelf AI product from some other company. When it comes to frontier model development, that's typically done by startups raising a lot of money. And like I said, that seems to be pretty healthy. So in this video, we're gonna focus on the other two aspects. There's a very long tail of companies with less expertise that want to just fine tune a model or even purchase an existing AI based solution off the shelf. Going back to the IBM survey of large enterprises for a moment, they found that AI adoption amongst these enterprises has hovered at around 50% for the last six years. And then in 2024, it suddenly jumped to 72%. For comparison, in 2023, AI adoption did not reach 66% in any geographic region. But this year, nearly every region exceeds 66%. This isn't saying that 66% of enterprises are now AI companies, but rather that they have adopted AI in at least one business function. Actually, half of the organizations are now using AI in at least two business functions, which is up from one third last year. I'll talk more about what a business function is in a moment. Just over half, 53% of these reported AI uses are off the shelf with no customization. The other half is mostly fine tuning rather than training frontier models, of course. And it takes between one to four months to put a generative AI solution into production. This is not bad at all. We're talking about really large enterprises here and they usually move very slowly. So for them to take on an entirely new technology and use it to start automating business functions and to have that process last only one to four months, that's amazing. That means that the usability of generative AI systems has improved immensely. So now more about business functions. That's basically just a process that probably involves lots of people, lots of computers, lots of databases, and now starts to involve AI. 
For example, in a marketing and sales department, about 16% of those companies are now using AI to do content support, which basically means they're using ChatGPT to write some of their content, while 15% are using generative AI for personalized marketing, perhaps in customized emails to their clients, for example. These numbers are lower, by the way, because not every company has the same business process. Not every company sends personalized emails to their customers, for example. In product development, about 10% of the companies used generative AI to support design development, which I think means prototyping and doing the work of a designer. Interestingly, having the IT help desk use an AI chatbot or use AI for data management both came in at only 7%. I guess IT people like to remain employed. Of all these 8,000 plus people, 55% now use generative AI either at home or at work. And that 55% is up from 38% last year. So yes, plenty of people are still being introduced to AI in their day-to-day -day lives in 2024. The percentage of people that use generative AI both at home and at work rose from 14% to 26% between 2023 and 2024. It's hard to say which way around that's going, whether people start using it at work and then start using it at home or vice versa, but it's great to see those types of synergies forming. I have an interesting example of a business adopting generative AI tech. I have an account with a financial service that I don't use very often, and they had been emailing me constantly saying, please log in to accept our new terms of service. Otherwise, your account will remain locked, etc., etc. Because I didn't use this service very often, I didn't really care that my account was currently locked. So I ignored all the emails. But then I received a phone call from a bot, which was very engaging. It started off by saying, hello, I'm a support bot from XYZ company, and I'm here to remind you that your account is locked. Please feel free to have a conversation with me and ask me anything. The bot also sent me an email right away so I could go and check to make sure it wasn't a spam call. And then it very pleasantly responded to any questions I would have with really low latency, impressively low latency. So of course, I logged onto the website right away and accepted their new terms of service. Although there's a lot of novelty factor there in why I logged in, I suspect that this method is a lot more effective than just sending random emails. So from the business's perspective, they created a new generative AI solution. They don't have to hire a lot of new customer support people, and the results are better. They end up with more customer accounts that are unlocked, which means they look active, which means that that company can claim, hey, we have a higher number of active users which is great for their business. So it's no wonder that when regular people start having these types of interactions, they turn around to their own company and say, hey, we should really look into generative AI. Part two, tackling risks with automated red teaming. That title is kind of long, but I just want to talk about how companies are tackling these risks the security, legal, and brand reputation risks. The path seems to look something like this. First, employees at the company make a prototype, and it seems to work reasonably well, but maybe it exposes too much information through the database, maybe it's possible for one customer to access another customer's data, for example, or it ends up recommending competitor products in the chatbot, etc. So the company doesn't have enough assurance about the security of the model, the legality of its output, and the brand reputation of the types of things that it might be saying. There's no shortage of ideas Ideas and implementation is relatively straightforward, but these products never actually get deployed to production. Doing that opens a huge can of worms that the company would rather leave alone. So if the perceived risk is high, the project just doesn't go ahead. So how do some companies actually end up deploying things? How do they lower that risk? To answer that question, I interviewed startup founder Ian Webster. Ian has been working on LLM security for quite some time now. He defines AI security or LLM security as the study of blockers to productionizing AI systems today in companies. And AI security is different from AI safety, which talks more about existential risks. Ian Webster was the lead of the LLM team at Discord, where they deployed bots to hundreds of millions of users. Now, just under a year ago, Ian created a startup called PromptFoo. PromptFoo still has a very small team, but they recently recently raised $5 million, so I'm sure they're about to grow. PromptFoo is an open source tool that helps companies test apps. It's what they call an eval framework or a red teaming tool. The term red teaming comes from security, where if you're simulating attacks, you have a red team that's doing the attack and a blue team that's trying to defend those attacks. So automated red teaming means automated attacking, automated search for security vulnerabilities. But PromptFoo checks for all kinds of things in those three categories that I mentioned, security risk, 
legal risk, and brand risk. Like I said, PromptFoo is open source and it has 25,000 users or so, so it seems to be getting a lot of traction. Although that might have sounded like a sponsorship, PromptFoo didn't sponsor me. I just spoke with Ian for the content of this video. But nevertheless, if you'd like to check out the framework, there's a link to it in the description. Most of the focus of red teaming tools is on how to red team frontier models. But looking at the app level is harder, and that's the scenario where you have an actual company that's trying to use this system for one of their products. The people doing development of these products in companies are a lot less experienced with the issues that can arise when you embed an LLM into your system. And if there are security vulnerabilities in this thing, it's likely to rebound on the company very quickly as they end up selling products for one cent or that sort of thing. Again, the environment is that people have an AI system getting hooked up to databases, being able to see the list of all users, having access to pretty business critical documentation. And it's a systems integration issue. The model can end up attacking other portions of the system through prompt injection or even indirect prompt injection. For example, maybe you can ask the model, hey, what's your IP address? And it might know within its internal infrastructure. And ironically, models are getting more vulnerable as they get better at reasoning because you can ask them to do more sophisticated things. Prompt foo is all about black box attacks, which means it doesn't have to have any visibility into how the LLM system is working. For example, you could just have your product expose itself as a REST API and then point prompt foo at that system and it can try executing different types of queries and do its prompt injection magic. You could think of this as sort of the equivalent of the Metasploit framework for LLMs, where Metasploit just contains a bunch of different network vulnerabilities that people can run on a system and try to carry out attacks over the network. How do the prompt foo test cases work? Well, some of them are non-deterministic, some of them are deterministic, but many are model graded, which means you have an LLM within PromptFoo that judges the result to see if the attack was successful or not. The human that creates the test case provides a rubric, a guide for what the examples should look like. Like, here's an example of what a good output would look like, a mediocre output, and a bad output. Then you have tuned LLM graders that can take the output from the system you're actually looking at and judge whether it's good or bad. In theory, you can use PromptFoo with any type of system, even an agentic one, although the state space really explodes in that case and it becomes a lot more complicated and time consuming to test. Like I mentioned, PromptFoo is black box and that's for simplicity, ease of use, etc. But there are also other types of techniques out there that can actually look at the model weights of the LLM that you're trying to target and try to find attack weak points more quickly. Sometimes people even run a local copy of an LLM and try to carry out an attack on that and then transform the attack to the actual target system. So there are lots of techniques out there, but I think PromptFoo is pretty clever. I've seen people even on my own Discord saying, hmm, I would love to write down some test cases to judge some property of LLMs, like how conscious they are, how aligned they are, how good they are at reasoning, etc. And I think that this type of framework really allows all those use cases and more. So check it out. Part three, implications of increased adoption. As I mentioned earlier with some statistics, it seems like AI adoption by enterprises is actually still accelerating. Just one more stat, 42% of IT professionals say they have already actively deployed generative AI, and an additional 40% say they're actively exploring it. Of course, IT professionals are probably gonna be some of the first people to think I should try using this AI inside an enterprise. But these are still really large numbers. And something I didn't mention earlier is that this phenomenon is occurring worldwide. Of course, the IBM study targeted a lot of different geographic regions. Some countries are leading AI adoption. For example, India, UAE, and Singapore, which have 59%, 58%, and 53% adoption, respectively. That means, again, from a sample of organizations of more than 1,000 employees, 59% of such organizations in India are using generative AI. Even at the bottom of the list where you have Spain and France at 28% and 26% respectively, I think that those numbers are still quite high given the slow speed with which companies of that size usually adopt new technology. By the way, on a different chart, Canada ranks 20th out of 35 countries for AI adoption. This included companies with 10 or more employees. So it's basically the entire private sector. Yes, unfortunately, Canada is among those that are slow to adopt new forms of capital. So deploying AI systems seems to be getting easier and the security of those systems 
seems to be getting more mature. In fact, MITRE recently released a framework for classifying AI vulnerabilities. If you haven't heard of MITRE before, they're a nonprofit in the US that runs the CVE system. Anytime there's a vulnerability discovered in any piece of software, it gets a CVE assigned to it, which is just a unique identifier to track it. So MITRE is heavily involved in the security space. They've also created the attack framework, which basically specifies all the different ways that an attacker would try to get into your system, all the different steps that they might take along the way. The framework can be presented as a series of different columns where attackers generally focus on the left-hand columns before moving further and further right, but they can bounce around a lot. And within each column, there are a lot of different ways that they might try to carry out that attack step. This attack framework has become so widespread that large companies have to fulfill different compliance requirements based on the different columns. For example, they have to have some amount of security protection in all of the columns or some subset of the columns. So in a lot of ways, MITRE defines the language that people use when talking about security at the enterprise scale. So yes, they've just done the same thing for AI vulnerabilities. They've made an Atlas framework which has various different columns of different types of attacker activities or attack steps that an attacker might try to do as they're hacking through an LLM system to gain access to the rest of your infrastructure. This is really important to allow people at different organizations, especially those with less technical or security knowledge, to be able to talk to each other. And it's a really big sign of a maturing industry. So anyway, it seems like AI adoption may continue to increase because enterprises are starting to see additional value or even cost savings from using AI. Again, this is the simple sort of AI. It's things like chatbots and automated phone calls and figuring out what to say to different customers. If you're closer to the research or the leading edge of AI development, it all seems pretty silly and straightforward, but it's still very important. It's proving out the argument that AI can be financially valuable, even though generative AI has been famously difficult to integrate into products in the past. This is what allows investors to justify writing all those giant checks for AI startups. As larger companies start to use AI more, it's likely that compliance standards will also be introduced. Maybe you have to run a tool like PromptFoo every quarter or every year to show that your AI systems are in good shape, security speaking and legally speaking. This already happens with general security and data security with standards like ISO and SOC. This will drive even more business to AI evaluation tools like PromptFoo and hopefully allow businesses to create AI systems that are really resistant to cyber attack. Because right now, I'm sure it's the Wild West. Finally, in conclusion, in 2024, we've had a massive jump in the number of large-scale enterprises that are willing to use generative AI. For the last six years, the percentage has been about 50% of companies that are willing to use AI and now it's 72%. But companies still have to think about a lot of risks when they're introducing AI into their workplace. What are the security risks, the legal risks, and the brand risks that make them look bad to customers? Although there's no easy answer to those questions, there are tools like PromptFoo that are automated red teaming tools, or basically risk evaluation tools. You can point them at an LLM-based application and they'll try to carry out various sorts of attacks and take the responses and judge them with a separate LLM model. This helps companies gain confidence that their systems are not going to recommend a competitor's product on the first day that they're deployed. And we're starting to see signs of AI appearing in the mechanisms that big businesses use to ensure that they lower risks. For example, a new MITRE framework called Atlas that analyzes the different ways that an attacker could exploit an LLM-based system. And thanks again to Ian, creator of PromptFoo, for having a conversation with me about all this. I really appreciate it. If you liked this video, check out this previous one I made, the first in the series about AI security, where I discuss whether AI labs themselves might be hacked. All right, that's all I have for today. Thank you very much for watching. Bye.